Welcome to this Cody Connects webinar. This session was recorded live on October the 23rd, 2018, with participants from the Cody International Institute's Fall Rethinking Partnership Certificate course and course facilitators Anu Jean and Sheila Savage. Also in attendance online are other Cody graduates and interested individuals. Today's guest speaker is Mustafa Ismail. Mustafa has been working in the development sector for more than 14 years and is currently working for Oxfam in Palestine in the agribusiness and market facilitation field. He manages a portfolio of projects in the agribusiness in several value chains, including women and youth-led enterprise, scaling up and public-private partnerships towards the sustainable development for small-scale farmers. He is an agronomist, belongs to a farming family, and also farms himself. He's married with four brilliant children, two boys and two twin girls. We now will join the session in progress. Well, thank you for this. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I will go direct to the, my presentation. As the introduction says, I've been working for Oxfam uh, since uh, several years now in the development in, in Palestine. When talking about development is across the globe, it's a challenging topic. Uh, and particularly in, in certain areas, uh, and for sure, Palestine is one of those certain areas. Uh, it's really hard to work in, in development, uh, considering development in agriculture even, even harder. Uh, as I guess all of you know that Palestine is an occupied country, how to work in development under uh, military occupation is not uh, an easy task. Uh, with Oxfam and uh, partnership with uh, local NGOs, local private sector, uh, other actors, governmental, non-governmental, um, uh, we, we are proud to say that we managed to do uh, development in, in Palestine. Uh, that, of course, with lots of challenges, obstacles here and there we've been facing. But we always say whenever there is um, uh, an obstacle, a challenge, there is an opportunity as well. So we learn from that. Um, so Oxfam uh, have been in, in, in Palestine since almost 50 years, uh, mainly in humanitarian work. Uh, however, since almost 10 years now, we've been working in the development sector. So we shifted from humanitarian toward livelihood and then uh, development using the market system approaches. Um, we were lucky to convince some donors to start to implement development work in the agriculture sector in Palestine, because initially it was very hard and, and difficult. Um, many donors were reluctant, so were not believed. Uh, there will be development in Palestine, taking the political uh, context and, and situation in Palestine. From those uh, donors who agree and support us in the market systems approach are the um, Swiss Development Agency, Switzerland. We have also the Australian uh, government. We have the Sweden uh, government. Um, we have the uh, European Commission as a donor. So those are the, our main donors. Uh, today, I'm um, going to talk with you, uh, to you about the, our experience. We'll be focusing more on the, uh, our network, partnership, uh, and alliance. Um, we'll narrow the discussion and the presentation mainly in the great value chain, which is quite similar to other value chains. So how to improve the small-scale farm communities uh, in Palestine to have better access and to have power uh, to be able to decide in the olives and high value fruits, including grapes and others, and also in the small ruminant, uh, which is milk and, and uh, meat. Uh, so as said before, uh, since 2008-9, we were gradually moved from humanitarian work toward livelihoods and then toward market systems approach. Uh, we started with olives. Olives is the largest uh, value chain in, in the agriculture sector in Palestine in terms of planting uh, area, in terms of uh, employment and job offers for farmers. 
mainly small scale farmers in, in Palestine. Uh, similarly, um, grapes and high value fruits are the second uh, value chain. That's why we're also interested in and we've been working in, uh, in this value chain also since a while. Also, the third one is the small ruminant because it's a, again, it's a key um, uh, value chain who offers jobs for uh, thousands of people in both West Bank and, and Palestine. Talking about grapes and high value fruits, but also we have done similar uh, work and the olive uh, and the baby cucumber and vegetables in general, uh, thyme or za'atar, which is growing uh, very fast in Palestine. Uh, date palm, which also uh, growing mainly in, in Gaza. Um, food processing, uh, where uh, it's again a play um, uh, significant part in terms of employment, mainly for women uh, and mainly for informal work at house uh, level, especially in the season where there are surplus uh, in the um, uh, production uh, and oversupply. Uh, and of course, also we work in, in sheep and, and, and goat as, uh, as said before. Grape value chain. Um, this is our experience. We've been working uh, in this particular case. Um, going to present now, um, since almost three years now, with a wide network uh, and uh, facilitation and support uh, from our lovely partners in, in Kudi. Uh, we are proud to uh, demonstrate this success for you. Uh, and uh, again, to share our experience, we'll be more than happy to hear from you, your experience, your feedback, that also will, will uh, be acknowledged and will be adopted in our future work. Um, this is a picture where the grape backing house now is working, how it operates. Those are the young ladies who've been trained how to do the post harvest and to do sorting, uh, grading and packaging and labeling, and then to present it to the uh, local um, uh, domestic market and also regional and international markets. Um, grape value chain, it's a uh, very important uh, value chain in, in the agriculture in Palestine. Um, in terms of the cultivated area, it's estimated over 65,000 donums. Uh, each 10 donums equal one hectare. Uh, this unit is, is used in Palestine. Um, this is mainly in West Bank. Uh, in Gaza, it's less. We have almost over than 7,000 donums planted in grapes. What's even make it more important, grapes in Palestine, it's rain-fed. It's not irrigated. It's all relying uh, rain-fed, uh, which is really important in Palestine because water is an issue in Palestine. It's not that available. So that's why people rely on in, in certain uh, agricultural uh, pattern who rely more on um, uh, rainfall. Uh, total production grapes is uh, more than 65,000 uh, metric tons, which worth to uh, almost 55 million US dollars. 55 million dollars in, in Palestine, again, it's a lot. Palestine is a very tiny country. It might be not the same in other countries, but here it's worth a lot. Um, uh, Thus, the grapes, the grape value chain, it's the second in value chain uh, following the, um, the olives. Uh, it offers jobs and uh, employ employment for 16,000 people. Uh, this means 16,000 families. Uh, the average family is almost five uh, people. Uh, however, it gives also opportunities for women, but it's minimum. It's like 1,000 job opportunities for, uh, for women mainly. Uh, within their women cooperatives or mixed cooperatives uh, in the food processing and, and so on. Uh, grape production in Palestine in the span of over eight months. However, the peak uh, comes in two months, like um, uh, August and September. So 80% of the products fallen in two months. And that gives you the sense where the oversupply uh, and the supply glut, uh, where farmers face challenges. Uh, because oversupply to the market means less demand, means low price, means farmers losing money. And the money they, they receive 
in most cases they are not cover even the, uh, their cost to produce this um, uh, grapes. Um, agriculture in general and grapes, one of them in Palestine, it's um, uh, a protection. Uh, in many cases when the political situation is deteriorated here, security situation become bad and worse than it is now. Uh, many people, thousands of people will lose their jobs, so they go back to their agriculture, uh, to their farms and do agriculture. So it is a protection uh, also, that's why it's really important. And the grapes, there are uh, lots of uh, bottlenecks, but I will focus on the main, on the main bottlenecks that farmers are facing in, in, uh, in Palestine. Uh, in terms of policy and institutional environmental, they are not um, preferable. They are not favor, uh, in the favor of small scale farmers. Uh, so policies um, mainly toward uh, uh, investment in other uh, sectors, not in the agriculture. Um, so where investors are tax exempted if they invest in any sector except agriculture. This is weird things. So all the policies here, they are not encouraging actual farmers. The protection laws, they are not there. Uh, in some cases, they are there. They are not uh, enforced, not implemented. So this is one of the key challenge uh, that that farmers are facing in, in Palestine. Um, limited industrial development, farmer farmer organization. Uh, they are really uh, weak organization. Investment here is limited. Uh, they have very limited capacity in terms of marketing. Again, considering the closures and the creation, how to export outside. Even the skills and the know-how is not there. Third one is uh, an adequate, uh, adequate extension service, um, mainly post-harvest. Uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority and the Minister of Agriculture do some extensions, but uh, it's not in the adopting the new technologies across the globe. We kind of sometimes feel isolated. Uh, particularly in remote area where small scale farmers it's costly for the extension service to reach them there. So they are not in top of everything in terms of technologies, tools and techniques, mainly the, the post harvest. Uh, thus later on we'll talk about the tunnel ways of marketing, which is very bad and very, very basic, which also costs them to lose lots of money. Uh, in terms of market uh, practices, uh, it's also bad because of the skills and experience. Uh, traditionally, farmers are selling in bulk. Bulk means a box of 10 kilograms of grapes. You buy it, you will throw three, four kilograms away because they are bad, bad conditions. So they mix the good quality and the bad quality together and they collect them in, in old used uh, boxes or cartons and they sell it to the local market, uh, which is not attractive for, for consumers. Uh, thus, the price will be uh, very low, uh, which has also decreased the competitiveness of the grapes in, in the market. Uh, supply glut is, is one of the main challenge uh, also here because 80% of the grapes fall in, in two months. Um, as it's in fed agriculture in general and extension is, is weak, so the productivity is unstable. Sometimes it's good, other year, second year is, is bad. Uh, I can give you example, like in one year, uh, one donor can produce four or five tons of grapes, the second year can produce one ton. So it's almost one five. It's just because of the uh, low, rain, uh, low rain that year, low extension, bad extension, and, and so on. Uh, limited capacity of producers in terms of doing the uh, process uh, uh, or meeting the, the quality demand in the market that also decrease the the demand uh, thus the competitiveness is again is not that good uh, women's limited economic opportunities and uh, uh, and this value chain need more work in terms of skills in terms of marketing uh, to work in in, uh, in this agriculture and this creates mainly Despite all of these challenges, there are some room for development. There are some room for uh, better opportunities to gain more profits for farmers and uh, people who engage in this. 
Uh, thus, we con see continuous horizontal expansion in, in the uh, grapes. In the coming five years, like the uh, production will be increased uh, almost by 30%. This is quite substantial. Uh, we see there is a market opportunities uh, within the local market and export. Uh, for example, Israel used to export grapes. Now Israel barely covered their uh, domestic consumption. So there is an opportunity for Palestinians to export. The crisis in Syria, uh, it's also given opportunity to export grapes to Jordan, to Gulf countries. There is a, a room also there to capture. Um, one key key opportunity also the the production is uh, is over eight months if we manage to do it over 10 months that also is a great opportunity in terms of better returns and and uh, profit for farmers and also processed grapes it's still a great opportunity generally speaking mainly for women uh, if this to be commercialized not to be at small scale and with uh, individual women at household level. Um, so in terms of the, the way that farmers are selling and marketing their products, uh, now we have done an assessment uh, to validate actually uh, our, our figures and what, to, to work with stakeholders to convince them. So we validate with the, some statistics. We counted almost 23, uh, more than 23 US million, US dollar million losses due to the bad practices in terms of marketing because of lack of infrastructure, due to uh, lack of private sector investment. There is no management for supply and demand uh, in terms of uh, uh, extension services, agricultural practices, mainly uh, post harvest, which is really important. Packaging and labeling is, is very bad, thus also the return is bad. Uh, infrastructure, including uh, cold storage facilities, is an issue also uh, that leads to uh, losses. Uh, we have done uh, an assessment, the assessment and an uh, applied experiment as well. Uh, the result shows if Palestinian farmers and private sector invested in the cold storage, that will lead to an extra 50 million um, uh, US dollar uh, to the economies. Uh, so, and, and the, during the big time, which is August and September, the Israelis dumping the Palestinian market in grapes, where it's better packaged and labeled, so it attracts more consumer. So it's unfair uh, competition. In those pictures, you see the traditional way how farmers they just bring their grapes in bulk, uh, used in old boxes, very bad conditions, not cold systems. So sometimes you you see the grapes in, in very bad uh, conditions. Um, uh, thus, uh, the price is, is very uh, very low. Basically, what Oxfam and our local partners uh, and stakeholders, what what we have done. We have done the value chain, uh, great value chain analysis, where we identified the bottleneck opportunities, and then we developed our interventions. So we identified several bottlenecks. Of course, we are not the only player in this uh, context in this uh, sector. Um, so we focused on certain bottlenecks that we believe our added value, skills, and capacity that we can uh, address. Um, uh, we're also with our uh, local partners, with our stakeholders, with our private sector partnership, with the support from different actors uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, so the aim of the intervention is to mitigate the pressure on the price on the fresh produce, which basically created by a, the supply plots. Uh, grape producers and grape traders work together. Uh, instead of competing each other, uh, that's also on uh, the scope, and foster the collaboration between multi-stakeholders, and that's uh, it's a key su uh, success from this experience and from other experience as well. In this diagram, you can see the traditional um, uh, business, uh, how it works. Uh, Small-scale producers, 
Uh, I'm talking our, about our intervention, which is in an area uh, near Hebron, uh, in the south of uh, Palestine, called Halhul. Uh, we have 1,500 farmers who produce grapes. Uh, traditionally, they sell their grapes to the central market, to the local market, where agents and wholesalers, uh, they take the grapes, bulk, um, uh, all boxes, and they bring it in the early morning to the market, where tons of ton, tons and tons of grapes come to the market one time in two three hours maximum. Uh, and they go. what's the concert, uh, cons uh, constraints there? Lack of transparency. How to identify the price? How traders, wholesalers actually sell the the, the grapes? How they set uh, the price? In many cases. Wholesalers, they sell the price not in a fair price. They sell based on their relations with the buyer. They have good relation, they give a better price, which means lower price, which means losses for farmers. Uh, so it's, be, it's not transparent at all. Where farmers have nothing to do with that, have zero power. They just stand there and witness what's going on. They have zero influence. Um, quality of produced grapes. Is bad uh, the way it's packaged and presented, it's labeled, and sometimes it's queuing in the central market, so that's also damage the quality. Uh, sometimes they they do the harvest in the evening and they keep it till the early morning, which also, of course, lead to low uh, price. And again, it's low low profit for for farmer. Um, Again, in a country where there's no control for borders, it's under incubation. Agriculture in general, it's really hard to differentiate the source uh, of origin, uh, how to know whether this grapes from Palestine or not. So the Israeli grapes also uh, invade the market and dumped in the market, and it's subsidized by the Israeli government. It's a deliberate, it's a way uh, to enforce the incubation, basically. Uh, so it's unfair competition, which also harm the uh, agriculture. And the new business model, where we are targeting uh, over two years, only 200 small scale producers. Uh, and the, um, can I just interrupt you for a second? Um, yes. Just to highlight this point that Mustafa has said, because there are no hard boundaries between Israel and Palestine, and Israel controls all the geographical boundaries, what it does is that if it has more production of any produce, fresh produce, it can simply dump that produce into Palestine and lower the price in the Palestinian market. And that destroys the, the, uh, the farm prices for the Palestinian farmers. So th that dynamics is very real and happens on an everyday basis. And the consumer in Palestine does not know whether he or she is buying an Israeli produce, grape, or a Palestinian grape, because Palestine farmers are not able to, to label their produce as Palestine. So that's the kind of thing that he's talking about. How, do, how, does one, how, how does one create a market dynamics where consumers know what they are buying? And can they influence the whole market system? Sorry, I thought I'll just make that point. And go ahead, please. No, that's very good. Thank you. Thank you, much for that. Uh, it's exactly the, the case. Take into consideration also even Palestinian farmers are using an old boxes, which is mainly an Israeli boxes, labeled in the same language, which is Hebrew. So it's really hard and different to differentiate. Uh, no borders, no control over that. Uh, and it's a policy by the Israelis, not only in agriculture, in, in uh, grapes, but it's in all uh, agriculture and agriculture sectors in Palestine. So our uh, model uh, basically is to work with 200 farmers uh, over two years, uh, and the aim that this also business will grow up and will scale up in, in the coming years. Um, those 200 farmers and small scale producers who got trained uh, uh, from the program, from Oxfam and our local partners in partnership with the Ministry of Agriculture, where we uh, brought experts in post harvest, they done the training, capacity building, including farmers and agronomists, extension agents, the Minister of Agriculture and the private extension agents to guarantee the sustainability of the capacity building for post-harvest. At the same time, also, 
the training also included uh, the um, uh, the great banking house uh, employees uh, to be supervised and uh, uh, monitor the uh, farmers while they do the harvest and bring it to the uh, banking house. So the new business model that we proposed as Oxfam and our partners, which is those 200 uh, small-scale farmers will um, sell to the company, the backing house company called Chad directly, and Chad company will sell to the local and international markets. So it's not to the central market, traditionally central markets where all the quantities are coming there, no. Farmers are bringing their product to the backing house, and the backing house, they do the sorting, grading, packaging, labeling, and they sell it to the uh, retailers, uh, outlets, and, and supermarkets. So it's avoiding, basically, it's a new marketing channel. It's avoiding the central market. Um, that gives better opportunities, decrease the competition, and they fill it in, in new boxes, uh, labeled uh, in, in Arabic language, Palestine, uh, so it's uh, mentioned the source of origin, so people at least know from where this uh, uh, product are coming and in, in the local market. So consumer know it and, and buy it better. Uh, so this is the, the, the pilot. Um, intervention summary, basically this um, uh, backing house, the Shahd Grape Company, it's a, a public-private partnership uh, between a wholesaler, between two wholesalers, uh, between uh, three farmers cooperatives, individual small scale producers, and the Chamber of Commerce in Halhul. Uh, having different stakeholders with different interests to find the, the joint uh, vision uh, and mission and to agree in, to invest in this investment was not an easy task. Uh, I will talk in details about this, uh, how we facilitated this, how much time uh, does require, uh, requires patience, uh, uh, time and resources and, and efforts. We managed to do it, and that's one of the key elements for, uh, for success, uh, I guess. Um, uh, what the company and the backing house is doing now, they are purchasing high quality grapes uh, from small scale producers based in kilograms, not uh, in bulk. That's also a uh, fair uh, practice for farmers. And instead of selling in bulk, bulk sometimes is 8 kilos, sometimes 10 kilos, it depends. Uh, however, now they are selling in kilograms. It's fair for traders, fair for farmers, fair for consumers. You know how what's the quantity that you are buying, and if you buy it, you know that you are buying a good quality. You will not uh, lose any anything from uh, this uh, grapes, and you'll buy the quality, the quantities you need. Uh, small families might buy one kilo, two kilos. Uh, large families might buy uh, like uh, bigger uh, quantities. So the facilitation of the, this partnership uh, was um, uh, done by the the program. Um, the company now is buying from the uh, the small scale producers, Oxfam and the local partner uh, all were uh, to facilitate the negotiation um, between the uh, the backing house and the small scale producers to have a fair price for both sides. And in uh, many cases also we have to subsidize, subsidize the, the price because it's, uh, I mean, the initial year just to put kind of incentives uh, for different actors. Um, for the first time, also the backing house contracted those small-scale producers. Uh, traditional market farmers sell their product and take it and sell it to the uh, central market without agreements, without contracts. In many cases, where there no market, they have to take their product back with them. In many cases, they have just to leave it for for no money, for zero, uh, because also bring it back to their homes and their farm will cost them some money. Now they have contracted uh, contractual agreement in quantities. Uh, so they know uh, the quantity they should harvest today, the quantities they should harvest tomorrow and the day after and so on, day by day, which is uh, setting the price and the quantities also um, uh, was like facilitated by the program. Um, uh, they, 
backing house and the company uh, may invested a lot in terms of promotion uh, to raise their shares in the local market in West Bank and they managed to reach Gaza market for the first time. Uh, for whom they don't know uh, the geography of Palestine, it's what's remain of Palestine now it's two uh, geographical area which is West Bank and Gaza. Uh, they are um, two separated uh, parts in order to take a product from West Bank to Gaza, you need to go through Israel and you need lots of permits and so on. It's not an easy task to do it again. Uh, the backing house managed to do that. Um, they uh, also, the uh, backing house managed for the first time uh, to do a pilot in terms of uh, uh, store the Palestinian grape and uh, a cold storage for over uh, three months, a particular 105 days. Uh, which is uh, a very successful experiment where demonstrate for other actors, particularly investors, there is a room to invest in, in this infrastructure. And that means a lot. Uh, if you store the grapes in the big time where the price is really low uh, for the off season, that the prices go up. That will benefit farmers, that will benefit also investors. Of course, also that will benefit consumers. They will find the grapes uh, during the off season. Uh, where also the, the program uh, facilitated and uh, subsidized this uh, uh, experiment. Um, just a quick um, uh, interrupt. So what, yeah. what Mustafa has uh, given us is the whole detail of the market dynamics, which may or may not be useful for all of us uh, because we are not agriculturists. Right? But what, what is telling us is that how do you understand the dynamics of a market system and understand who the players are and then make the interventions to address some of those gaps. Yeah? And so no matter where you are, the analysis is critical to be able to, uh, to, to design your programs. Um, so um, sorry again for the online people, this is Anuj from Kodi. Um, uh, Mustafa, we have roughly uh, 20 more minutes before, um, uh, you know, after that we can, we can get into some of the question answers. So please take us away. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the, the market uptake here actually um, to work with the small scale producers uh, in terms of uh, adopting the good agricultural practices that we facilitated by the, uh, the program. Uh, small scale producers also um, to agree and to accept this model because you are, we are changing their mentalities and attitudes. That's not easy. So. You need to choose the right, the right people to work with. Oh, that's also required efforts and, and, and time. Um, so they accept to do grading and, and uh, initial grading uh, at, at the farm level also. Uh, that also was facilitated by the, uh, the program. And also those uh, small scale producers to be able to commit themselves to, tell, to sell the grapes to the backing house um, and based on the contractual agreement. So it's, it's a mutual commitment uh, and agreements between both parties. So it's uh, facilitated also by uh, the, the program uh, and also the women cooperatives who easily can find the, uh, the low quality grapes, uh, we call it the grade C after the, uh, the backing house through the grading and packaging. So the women cooperatives took the low, low quality for uh, processing, which also good opportunities for uh, job opportunities for women. You have seen the, the traditional way of introducing grapes to the local market. This is the new way how the uh, uh, backing house introduced the grapes to the local market. Uh, and one kilograms and five kilograms, uh, top quality for local market, uh, for the international market. Uh, and also uh, they managed even to sell it to the Israeli market where it was kind of taboo uh, for the first time they managed to do it with this labeling and packaging. Um, crowding in, we see um, now the backing house, which is only one season now, they managed to sell uh, 50,000 tons of grapes, good quality grapes. They managed to work with uh, more than 100 small scale producers, which is good achievement. Um, uh, that gave a new market opportunity be reaching Gaza market. Uh, Gaza market is demanding for, for grapes and also uh, three trial shipments for Gulf countries. That's also 
uh, it, it shed the light there is an opportunity in this market for Palestinian grapes, um, high quality grapes and, uh, and a bit of packaging and labeling introduced to the local uh, farmers, uh, which is also uh, got replicated by others. Uh, the backing house now sells their services for other uh, traders and other uh, 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 like wholesalers. Uh, also, they, they received the feedback from the consumers and adopted how to improve their, their uh, products. Um, so they are selling services as well for other traders. Um, negotiating the price, it's the first time that farmers be able to negotiate the price. In the traditional market, they, they have zero influence. Uh, they are not negotiating. And even the, the way they set the price is not trans transparent. Now they, they were able to negotiate. And the uh, backing house also give a kind of reward, rewarding uh, uh, price, which is kind of one shekel extra as a premium uh, market uh, price. One shekel means like one third of the price. Uh, it's a quite a lot. Um, so uh, that also gave an opportunities for uh, women and women cooperatives to uh, work in the low grade uh, grapes. Um, so they work on larger scales and. and Palestine and marketed, um, investing and scaling up um, capacity. Uh, now the they stakeholders in the backing house, which is again the wholesalers, cooperatives, individual, small scale producers, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, because they, the model proved itself to work. Uh, now they are investing almost 700 thousand US dollar to build uh, a permanent backing house and to build a, um, a cold uh, facility uh, so the, to store the grapes and to do this uh, to take it up to scale uh, without this pilot they will not be even willing to invest this huge money uh, in, in a risky uh, sector in a risky context as, as Palestine uh, I can't tell you it took us more than one 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 year actually to find the right stakeholders um, of course, looking for a profit, but also who are looking also for development to develop this sector uh, and also look for social impact, how to, to benefit the society in general, uh, how to give better opportunities for farmers, for, for women, for youth. Uh, that's why, I mean, those stakeholders agree to come together and to invest in this uh, sector uh, and this great business idea because they believed in the business idea that they the program with, with multi-stakeholders uh, identified. So uh, they accepted to, to fund. And uh, I can tell you having uh, a public uh, body like the Chamber of Commerce to be partner, to be shareholder in, in this initiative, that also was a key success. Um, the Minister of Agriculture uh, in Palestine and Zaytun UK, which is a private sector company based in, in UK, uh, and several NGOs like local, international, private sector also um, show interest and uh, in, in this model, and they start believing this model. Uh, like the Minister of Agriculture took Shahda Company uh, to uh, uh, train farmers in the post harvest. So they bring other farmers to come to the company and attend the training in post harvest. Uh, Zaytun UK also visited the company and start negotiation and a potential and possibility to sort of run them to uh, the UK. Having all of this interest also, uh, that's give the, uh, the initiative more, uh, more weight. Um, having said that, uh, what things look like on, on the ground? Um, have different stakeholders to be partners and sometimes alliances, not necessarily to be uh, contractual partners and to be uh, of partners uh, in terms of financial commitments and so on. It's just alliance. They bring their experience. They bring their their influence. Uh, so having a multi stakeholders uh, that a key success for any market system. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, any anywhere in the world. Um, now we see uh, farming communities and their cooperatives have more influence uh, and uh, uh, more more voice to raise and. Uh, instead of just keep uh, investing as a farmers, now also they invest as investors. They also um, 
become a market actor. Um, uh, having the um, like uh, governmental bodies, public bodies like the cooperative department, the Ministry of Agriculture and other um, government bodies where uh, they listen directly to the uh, challenges faced by farmers, by stakeholders. They adopt policies, they change. Uh, so that is actually our life in terms of uh, taking certain bottlenecks and take to the government to change something. Usually it takes time. Having them in the loop and be part of the discussion of the multi-stakeholders uh, dialogues, that also um, uh, facilitate and, and help and is, is our, our life. I believe um, in development, uh, generally speaking, uh, without the private sector, it's, uh, it's a mess. I mean, you can't do great and real development unless you have the private sector because they have, uh, they have the money, basically. If they believe there is a business opportunity, uh, if they believe there is a, a successful business idea, they will grab it. Uh, they will not reluctant to do that. Of course, not all the private sector, but you need to open dialogue uh, with them. You need to, to know them, to come cl close and with a good relation with, with private sector. You see with uh, what a private sector you could work. With those you couldn't work, at least you could have them in your sight, uh, instead of being competing with you or being uh, against you. Wholesalers, traders, supermarkets, all of those are, uh, are actors and key actors without knowing their, their need, their, their vision, their view, their uh, willingness. Uh, you can't move uh, ahead and do a real development in, in the ground. Uh, having the representative bodies like uh, Grape uh, uh, Council, like other councils, unions, that also uh, helped you a lot. Um, having uh, universities, uh, experts, whether nationally from outside, uh, to have the, to be on top of things, on top of technologies, how to adapt technologies, uh, do research, et cetera, et cetera. That, uh, I mean, uh, they, I mean, those people who have the influence, who have the skills, the knowledge, uh, so you will have uh, maybe different interests. So you will have all of these, those people's thoughts, and then you can conclude together with those stakeholders what's the right decision, what's the right intervention to, um, uh, to move. Uh, and of course, in top things, uh, outstanding partners to to facilitate and um, facilitation is not an easy task to do it you need the right people right skills to do the facilitation people who are knowledgeable patient um, devoted to devote time efforts uh, and keep listen and moderate between people because you are negotiating you are with different people different interests different background um, and you need to choose the the right time and keep the momentum. Sometimes, uh, in, in many cases, if you don't take the right decision in the right time and the right place, you just lose your work. Even you waste like one, two years of negotiation, uh, you just lose it. So those people from the uh, like facil fac facilitators need to be also empowered and uh, decision makers because sometimes you need to decide on spot. You need to take decisions uh, because if you want to tell the private sector people, uh, I want to take like two or three days to go and check uh, the possibility, check the procedures, so on, uh, they might just leave uh, the, the discussion uh, and you will lose what, what you have done. I mean, um, so in terms of achievements and in, in this, like multi stakeholders in this pilot and, and, and initiatives, um, uh, I guess investment and analysis have the right analysis that gives you the right directions without the right analysis believe me you will spend years uh, of, uh, of your time few your resources uh, implementing wrong things you might achieve uh, something in the short run but not in the long run not in, in the development so knowing the dynamics in the market knowing the gender dynamics knowing the value chains constraints etc context all of these things, uh, other actors, what they are doing, where and when, that of course will help you. So you need to have the right analysis uh, on hand. Um, you need strategic partnerships and alliance uh, without uh, wide strategic ship, uh, partnership, wide alliance. Uh, sustainability is an issue because Oxfam, uh, I mean, 
uh, whatever organization, international or local NGOs. Donors, at the end of the day, they are leaving. They will not stay forever. If you don't have the, the right partnerships, the right alliance, once you quit or you exit, your intervention will be collapsed. So you need to keep that on, uh, on, on, on board. Um, promoting women's participation uh, is, is a key issue. It's not about numbers. It's real. Uh, you need to have, because women's skills, uh, experience, uh, knowledge, um, they can, of course, add value. They can, of course, add value. So you need to promote women participation uh, in strategic interventions uh, and partnerships. Uh, in this particular case, uh, women cooperative uh, on 25% of the, uh, the banking house as shareholders. And also a woman, she's chair of the board. So she's one of the decision uh, making makers. Um, influencing different market uh, actors, you need to do, to have like, uh, based on the analysis you have it, you, you might need to do some advocacy, some lobbying. Um, sometimes you need to develop the standards you have to be able to export outside. Uh, registration, believe me, it took us months and months uh, just to, to do the registration for the backing house, which is, shouldn't take like more than one month, it took us a year. Uh, so um, having the influence, uh, having doing the lobbying and advocacy, um, uh, having the evidence, and not necessarily you do that yourself, by the way. In many cases, it's better if you leave it. You know, in, in Palestine, 90%, 90% of the, the work we've done, it's done by, by other alliances and partners. Oxfam even behind the scene. Uh, in a few cases where we believe um, we can give weight as Oxfam, so we present. In many cases, we leave it to local partners, NGOs, governmental bodies, we leave it to private sector, we leave it to alliance, not necessarily contractual partners. They do it, they do it faster and much better than we do it. Uh, especially if we talk about something um, like related to policies, regulations. In, in many cases, many countries, it's sensitive. So if you talk as international NGOs, Assembly people will attack you. What's your, your business here? It's not yours. But if it's a, a, a local, a national actor, who can do it? Assembly can do it. Uh, they are in a much better position to do it. So right alliance, alliance uh, and partners are, are very good techniques to, to work and, and do it. Uh, Despite all of that, we still have challenges, of course. I mean, applying the market system in a challenging uh, context like Palestine, where it's heavily subsidized, uh, it's not easy. Uh, we've been uh, faced with several challenges with the private sector, with international, with national, with governmental bodies. Uh, how to shift people mentality from 100% subsidies, it's just a grant, uh, to a more systemic uh, or system market system approach where like less subsidies. In many cases, for our interventions, like in this grades or others, our uh, like financial contribution, believe me, less than 5%, only 5%, 95% from stakeholders. It is hard. It's not easy, but it works. It works, believe me. Um, so market system versus direct delivery culture, it's an issue. It's at personal level, at I mean, human, uh, individual. It's also at institutional level. In many cases, we deal with uh, institutions, they don't believe in market system. Especially the excuse that we are under incubation, it's a unique context, which is true. It's a unique context, but it's, it's doable. With many challenges, of course, it's not easy. Um, challenge, visibility versus impact, credibility. As said before, many cases, donor would love to see their names. Oxfam would love to see their names. I personally would love to see my name. Everyone would love to see their, that. But the question is, are we looking to see our names only, or are we aiming beyond that? We are looking for the impact. What about if we believe the impact can be much better and higher without our names? I will say simply, do it without our name. Just go and do it. We manage through our alliance to change several laws in Palestine without mentioning even Oxfam with our alliance and local partners. 
they are in a much stronger position than us to do it. Um, in many cases, NGOs and donor procedures, uh, they are an obstacle, a challenge, because private sector investors are looking for quick ones. Something is like this. Uh, if you want to go for procedures, sometimes uh, I know it's uh, it's hard to change it. Uh, but I guess uh, the more we can be flexible, the more we can uh, achieve, especially working with multi stakeholders, multi partners, uh, alliance. Uh, you need to be quick, uh, flexible, uh, flexible. Um, not, I mean, to not limit it. I mean, to be really very flexible because you need to decide sometimes in, on the spot. Um, sometimes you need to waive all of your procedures. Uh, so the more flexible donors you have, the more flexible uh, procedures you have, the more flex flexible personality you have. Um, believe me, you will do a better job. Uh, I guess I'm done with the presentation. We'll be more than happy to hear uh, any feedback and questions. Uh, and thank you for uh, listening uh, for me. Thank you so much. That's very, very useful. Thank you. Um, we will launch into uh, the question and answers and we'll keep our uh, mic on here. Uh, and if there might be online questions, if at all, Wendy would uh, moderate that. So anyone who has questions, if they can raise their hand and then come and speak at the mic here. Um, and also the folks who are online, if you want to type your question in the chat bubble, we will make sure that Mustafa sees it. Come on. So we have Father Dominic uh, from India, uh, who's going to ask you a question. When you presented the challenges, I'd like to know the delivery culture change and the NGO donor and the MSP's approaches. Could you please uh, little more elaborate why these challenges can be overcome it and how it is built? Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, we'll answer question by question. Sure, for now, and I'll line up other questions uh, for you. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for the, the question. It's a very good question. Uh, um, it's a challenge where in Palestine have lots of donors, and most of those donors are working in a humanitarian. Uh, so direct delivery, direct services, uh, which basically should be done by the state, but because we are under incubation, it's a different context. So it's mostly done by donor uh, agencies. Um, but in, in, uh, in most cases, we're talking about small grants, uh, small grants uh, that not enough for, for uh, investment. Uh, so like some tools, some machines, uh, some training, uh, project-based. So they are not systematic, uh, they are not continuous. So it's a project-based, they do some training uh, in this field or in that field, and, and then uh, just run and finish the project. Um, when we talk, um, the challenge we face now, we'll talk about more development interventions. Um, that requires different, uh, um, maybe more contribution in terms of uh, human resources, in terms of financial contribution, uh, because we are talking about uh, uh, medium to, to large, actually, uh, to large level of investment. So it's not at household. Uh, investment. Uh, it's not a livelihood, it's more toward um, uh, medium businesses to large businesses. Uh, so like the, the one I mentioned, uh, so the, the backing house now they are building, the, the company, the backing house is building, it's cost 700,000 US dollars. Uh, so no donor money will build it. So they, they are themselves building. The program we facilitate uh, uh, just the registration as a company, uh, the design and the layout to be based on the standards and so on. It's just the small things we, we supported them and we give them also the, the expertise in how to do that. Um, the challenge here, how to convince farmers and, uh, and um, uh, their cooperatives to come and invest, contribute financially 
like in this particular case, uh, farmers and cooperatives, they own 47% of the shares of the banking house. They already contribute cash money on the bank to buy and to invest and to do so. Um, while the culture here, farmers just re receive things for free. And now we are coming to tell them, okay, we'll support you uh, with technical expertise, we'll link you with the private sector, we'll link you with um, uh, public uh, like institutions or so, we'll support you in terms of promotion, marketing, capacity building, and so on. But in terms of financial capacity, we'll give you our contribution. We might contribute 10 percent, 15 percent. So that's a challenge, uh, which also, uh, unfortunately, it's influenced even the private sector. In many cases, where even the private sector, they just come to join because they're looking, looking for subsidy. Can you imagine that? They have money, but they said if Oxfam is there, if donor is there, they are willing to give money, why not to take it? When they show are not talking about to give a huge amount of money, rather we are asking them to invest, but we show them the business case. There is a business case, a profitable business case. So this evidence, the solid business case we presented to the wholesalers, to the investors, like they, they experiment in storing the, the grapes over three months. That's a very a solid evidence uh, for wholesalers to invest in this. Because when we started the dialogue, they were reluctant. Why we to invest in this? Uh, we are not sure that will work. Now we've done it as an experiment from Oxfam. Now it's approved itself. So now they invest. They, the refrigerator they, they are building now, uh, it costs 100,000 US dollars. They are investing in it themselves with zero contribution from Oxfam. This sort of challenge we are facing with uh, farmers, cooperatives, uh, with the uh, stakeholders in general. How we, we manage it, I mean, having the right staff in place, having the right partners, alliance, having the right analysis, because information is the key. Having the solid business models and business ideas. If you bring different stakeholders to the room to discuss with them, if you are not confident uh, from the, the, uh, the obstacle, the bottleneck, and confident the solution that you are proposing, people will not believe you. If you are confident, you have the right analysis, the right business case, you just present it, this is the solution. Of course, we acknowledge uh, agriculture, it's a risky sector. That's why we, as a donor money, uh, uh, will mitigate your risk, will share your risk. Okay, instead of you are doing uh, all of this investment 100% yourself, we mitigate. So that's why we call it smart subsidies. Smart, you decide based on the context, you know, uh, better than I know, I mean, in your place, I'm better than you in my place. So you decide in which way to put it. Great, thank you. Uh, we have Amber, we have Amber asking you a question. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Mustafa. This is very informative for us. Uh, but my quick question is, um, you talked about the bottleneck, um, 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 the list of bottlenecks you listed. Um, one of it you talked about on favorable policies and institutional environment. So I was trying to know, um, because of course we know policy issues um, could have um, positive or negative effect in your programs. So how were you able to deal with this bottleneck, which also include the unfavorable policies and institutional environment? Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amir. Was a very good question. Um, uh, policy is the key uh, for any change, for any development. Uh, uh, again, in, uh, in a place where it's unstable, like Palestine, it's even more important. I will talk about policy. Uh, policies here. We talk about two level of policies: uh, the Palestinian internal policies and the Israeli policy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, we have to deal with two different policies uh, because traders, farmers, if they want to import or export they need to go through both policies, the Palestinian policy, Israeli policies. Uh, I can uh, claim that um, uh, the only people who pay two taxes in the world is Palestinians. Uh, unfortunately, this is the situation. Uh, how we deal with that? Um, again, with multi-stakeholders, the right analysis, and we do advocacy and, and policy on that. That's why I said in, in many cases, Oxfam not feasible. We do it through our local partners, uh, our uh, 
private sectors uh, alliance um, I can give you one example like in Palestine this is uh, Palestinian law not Israeli law if you want to invest in any sector you are tax free except the agriculture if you want to invest in agriculture you need to pay tax if you want to register any startup business you register it for free except in the agriculture if you want to do it in the agriculture you need to go through a longer process you need to pay fees and etc etc um through dialogues with with partners multi-stakeholders having also the the public uh, institution in this particular case we have the chamber of commerce as you know chamber of commerce they are not a profitable organization but they are governmental body they help us a lot they know better than any one else the, the policies and the laws and they have their networks and connections how to adapt it how to change it how to do it etc etc uh, so for example for this particular case they managed to operate the banking house uh, almost one year without um, officially registered in the tax department uh, they registered it under their incubation they said it's still in the incubation period so they know they know the policies um, over uh, like seven years i can tell you we managed to adapt to change uh, some laws in, in palestine and not the israeli the israeli one it's, it's more tough uh, and we deal with it and in the international policies uh, we have less influence to be honest with you than the, the international policies but with the palestinian policy we are more influential uh, through our local uh, alliance and, and partner, partners we managed to change um, the tax law and the tax refund laws, which are great achievements, but again, it takes time. Uh, simply, we have done the analysis, right analysis. We presented uh, the results for um, for public, for stakeholders, and thus the the government had no other option unless to adapt and change some risks. Great, thank you, Mustafa. Just a quick interjection. Uh, we have a couple of more questions, so um, and the time is short, so. We will allow some questions to come in now, including the online. And I'm requesting you to keep your answers a bit short so that we can get more questions in. Uh, go ahead. Okay, this next question comes from Widya from uh, Indonesia and Sumatra Island. She is in an NGO and she, and she asks, um, Gustavo, you said the local NGO has better opportunity to do something more and donors prefer the locals because we have direct and bigger impact. But what we face here is the opposite. International NGOs like who has branches in Indonesia have more opportunities in getting donors than us. What do you suggest for us to do to get more attention from the donor? Well, uh, both cases are valid. I mean, the same it's in Palestine. Um, it's, it's not black and white, it depends on the case. So you, you do the analysis, I mean, you see the situation there. In, in Palestine, in many cases, international NGOs are more preferable and welcome. Uh, in other cases, uh, local NGOs. So depending the case. Uh, so if it's something like in, in, uh, uh, related to the internal policies, national policies uh, with the government here, so we think the local um, NGOs are stronger. Uh, however, that's, a different case in the relation with the donors. Um, each donor had their had their own regulation. So in many cases, they prefer the international NGOs, not the local NGOs. Others prefer other things. So it's quite a different uh, topics, but it depends on, on, on the case. Uh, you do the right analysis. You see, uh, because uh, I'm sure we all apply the no harm policies. So in, in some cases, if we want to interfere as Oxfam, we might harm other people and we might even harm our reputation. So it's better for others who do that. If they don't harm others and they don't harm their reputation, they do it. In other cases, we, we do it. So it depends on the case. Um, just to quickly add to that, um, um, I guess, uh, as Mustafa is saying, um, often, uh, even in the INGO sector, one of the things to monitor is how much role are they playing as a facilitator opposed to direct implementer and how much resources they are consuming themselves in maintaining themselves as opposed to uh, supporting the program on the ground. And that's a very interesting analysis to look at as well. Uh, and one of the things that I think Oxfam has tried to do is play a more facilitative role. And even though it is, 
it is still present in, in Palestine. It is, you know, bulk of the resources are now getting passed on to the local actors. But, you know, Mustafa will be able to say more on that. I have another question from Ephraim. Go ahead, Ephraim. Yeah. Thank you, Mustafa, for such an enlightening story. My question is like a bit of a context that you, you provided us. Like you have challenge at a micro, meso, and then macro level, and you have slightly touched the political, the political context that you are in. But my question is a bit of your scope of intervention. Are you really focusing on the micro, which is about household individual challenge that you are having in the program, and meso, which has to do with the system, institutional, institutional building, and also a policy level? And if you are doing it at, at the different, at the three different level, what are some of your tactics and strategies that you have implemented? in your particular context. A second question is your program seems a bit NGO driven that than it is a community driven initiative. How are you thinking of in terms of sustainability? Thank you. Um, we have another question coming from Margaret. Thank you so much for your presentation. My question is based on what you suggested that you have given preference to the public private partnership instead of dealing with the wholesalers. So in your new business model, does it mean that the wholesalers are no longer part of the supply chain? And in that case, can they not actually interfere or deal with your farmers directly? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, there are two very big questions. Uh, we'll try to do my best to answer. Um, well, uh, in terms of the level that Oxfam is working with, uh, well, in, in last like several years, we are focusing in, in micro to uh, large in investment. So the, our focus is uh, not at the household level. Uh, we believe that our added value more in, in this now. Uh, we have other actors who do more, uh, do more, and maybe do better than us uh, at the household level. So we are working. Um, uh, that's why I said it's more toward the uh, market systems, toward uh, uh, development. Uh, yes, we work with uh, uh, farmers, uh, groups, cooperatives, uh, startups, uh, traders and investors. Uh, we work with the public-private partnership. We work also on the policy level, uh, yes, but not uh, at household level, uh, particularly um, and the economic uh, justice program in, in Oxfam. We have other programs who work uh, at that level, and we have other actors who do that uh, things. Um, uh, that's, uh, of course, challenging uh, uh, field to work uh, on it. Um, uh, we, we have been working in, in different uh, value chains and, and subsectors. This is just one example I presented, but we have worked in, in other uh, um, value chains. So basically, we start from, from the beginning. We do a thorough, uh, what we call value chain analysis. We study um, based on a set of criteria um, uh, the uh, uh, sectors where they, uh, there is better opportunities for women, for youth, for farmers, the opportunity to grow up, a potential to uh, scale up this, this sector and that sector. Um, uh, uh, see the climate change sensitivity, water, etc., technologies, uh, other set of criteria and, uh, criteria, and based off that, we decide which value chains to work in. And those analysis also identify the bottlenecks, identify the uh, potential solutions, and also uh, we do stakeholder analysis. So we see who's done uh, what, where, and when. Uh, who, what's the added values and what they, everyone can add value to that. And uh, we start our work based on, uh, on, on that. This is in, in the technical, technical uh, part. And again, this is one of the examples that we are doing. Um, at the policy level, uh, of course, we have uh, two uh, level uh, of policies. We call the program policy level, which those policies are directly related to uh, farmers, to agribusiness uh, startups, uh, where we tackle uh, to mitigate and solve uh, some of the bottlenecks and the problems that um, uh, they targeted uh, value chains or so on we are facing. Um, the international uh, policies, which more toward the uh, uh, 
uh, incubation, uh, which is something uh, bigger than uh, programs, uh, where Oxfam take it at the international uh, level. Um, and policy, it's even more challenging in, in, in a unique context like Palestine. Uh, Oxfam, with our alliance, uh, we um, managed to achieve uh, several success, uh, well, like uh, at the national level, international level, but that takes time. I'm talking about minimum 10 years and over. Uh, so in market systems, policy change, uh, I mean, we can't take, talk about a program with less than 5 to 10 years minimum. Uh, so this is the way how how we um, uh, tackle it. Um, in terms of how to guarantee the uh, sustainability, uh, it is a big question again. Um, but having the right partner partnership, uh, having the uh, wholesalers, uh, having the uh, traders, uh, farmers, Farmer representative bodies like uh, unions, cooperatives, as a shareholders, um, uh, I think this is one of the sustainability uh, element. Um, believe me, uh, traders and investors will not invest in a risky area in a risky context if they uh, don't believe in the business idea, its work, and it's sustainable. Uh, since the beginning, we uh, we develop what we call it an intervention strategy where we study it from a business viability and feasibility, whether it's feasible or not. So we present and discuss and based on that facilitate the dialogue and that. And we still there um, monitor and give hands-on support and follow up. Will not exit unless we we almost guarantee there is a sustainability in, uh, in those elements. Right. Maybe quick. Uh, sorry, quick, um, just quick uh, addition to that. Uh, to give you a, a real example that I was witness to. Uh, we were talking to a number of women's cooperators um, and what they were doing, uh, including with, uh, converting grapes into molasses, uh, converting olive oil into or olive into uh, olive soap, olive paste, uh, olive uh, um, you know, different products and number of NGOs and uh, training institutions, but training, coming them and training on how to manage a cooperative, how to, um, how to do accounts, how to do reporting, all kinds of things, how to, how to produce soap. Uh, and one time um, I was witness of that, uh, probably I might have instigated that question. And I asked them, so you have gone, undergone these training three times, four times, what do you really want? And you know, one woman just stood up there and said, essentially we want, to know how to make money. All these trainings are good and we come here because we, we like it. But essentially, please help us do the market access. How can we access those hotels uh, in the Ramallah? How do we negotiate the deals with the traders? That's what we need. You know? So why I'm saying so is that uh, this, this false dichotomy between what is community based Often cooperatives and groups and collectives are seen as, as community based. But if you really go underneath, these are false dichotomies. Uh, when this program engages with farmers cooperatives and their councils, uh, they themselves are community based institutions. And, and by engaging them at a facilitation level, what Oxfam is, I think, trying to do uh, is move away from direct implementation at the community level, let that be the, the openness of the cooperatives and the collectives, but play a more facilitative role for them at the system level so that they can do better for their own members. And that's the kind of distinction I was wanting to draw uh, clearly, more, more clearly. But more to do uh, up in 10.30. Uh, if you can answer now, um, whose question was that? Margaret. Margaret's question uh, about why, and this is a question I let me also add, why did you decide to create a company as opposed to working with central market system, which is already existing, there are wholesalers, uh, why, why create a company, why not just go to them and say why can't, why can't you do sorting yourself and, and so tell us why you chose Packing House as a strategy and not traders or wholesalers or central market. Yeah, okay. I mean, thanks. It's again based in the context. Uh, it might be different from place to another. 
Um, the context here in, in Palestine, I mean, small scale producers, they, they own like uh, two to three donums, which mean like in a yearly basis, five to, to 10 uh, tons, which is not worth it by each farmer to do it himself. Uh, this is one thing. So the infrastructure, the investment is, a, is quite a huge for uh, individual farmers. It's not a big farmers who can invest and do that. Um, so that's one of the points. It's again also uh, the skills and the knowledge for farmers to do, to do these things. Um, of course, I mean, in, in market system, generally speaking, uh, it's, uh, it's better not to create uh, uh, new layers. And I can say we're not creating uh, a new layer. Uh, so we work with, with existing, uh, actually, stakeholders uh, and actors. So the, the two wholesalers who actually invested and partners and they, um, the backing house, they are from the uh, already, I mean, existing and trading. And themselves, they are uh, uh, from the largest traders in, in, in Palestine. And they already sell in the central market. So they believed in the idea. They invested in it. And, so they are basically not uh, uh, a new layer uh, uh, and uh, uh, we are creating. Uh, what's new here is having the farmers and uh, cooperatives as investors. Um, so they, they buy shares. So having the, the wholesalers who agree to partner with farmers, well, that's, that's uh, an issue. I mean, that's a good thing. We need to work on it. Uh, why we try to avoid the central market again? The central market is working in public, uh, sorry, in, in bulk system, um, and they sell uh, in, uh, in like in, for the wholesalers, not not for retailers. Um, uh, that's why it's also mobilized by many other traders who don't believe in in, in the idea. That's why we went to this uh, kind of partners. Uh, to find alternative market to go direct for uh, uh, retailers. And now the, uh, the uh, backing house also selling services for the central market itself for some traders there. Great. Um, just to quickly interject before I invite Salim to ask his question. Um, often, uh, A, uh, so in short, Margaret, uh, the program is not avoiding traders. In fact, it is inviting traders to become partners with the farmers. Uh, in the in that company that they have created, so they are they are partners. You know, they are actually investors. Uh, and other thing is that uh, one of the experiences in other value chain that Oxfam has, they had initial strategy to intervene in the central market system and see if the governance of the central market can be changed uh, to include small farmers on the board. Uh, they all agreed uh, in principle, but as soon as the implementation started, everybody walked away. Because many of the actors in the central market have interest in keeping the way the system is, because that's how they make money. So you have to understand the political economy of the system to say which stakeholder to work with and which stakeholder to avoid and which stakeholder to work against, because not all state your stakeholders are have the same objective as you. They may actually have an opposite objective as you, because they want to keep the system as it is, because that's how they make the money. So you have to really understand that dynamic, and I can tell you more about the central market in other value chains uh, in a bit. So Salim, please come up. Mustafa, thank you for providing such great insight into your local reality. I have two quick questions for you. Um, you talked about the whole, notwithstanding the geopolitical issues that exist within your reality, you spoke about the dumping of grapes from one jurisdiction to another. Um, but I haven't heard whether there are deliberate attempts to perhaps change the value chain or modify the value chain to create value, some kind of value added product to perhaps leverage um, your local reality and your local expertise into a product that is quite different to what is coming across the border. So I'd perhaps like to get a sense of whether that kind of research and thinking is happening at the moment. Secondly, you indicated that women's empowerment uh, or the lack of women's empowerment is currently a bottleneck, which is not unlike what happens in other parts of the world and, and even in my country, Guyana, where I'm from. To what extent, because I didn't hear you mention anything about land tenure, for example, but you indicated that about 5% of the women 
of the total population who are working within the grape industry are engaged in, in production and processing. But what is really the, the situation in terms of land tenure for those women? And not just for those women, but for all the other players within the industry. Because as you would have highlighted, there are specific challenges to your country as it relates to land more broadly. So how does this work to support the grape industry and really thinking about it from a partnership perspective? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, in terms of the Israeli dumping the um, product in the Palestinian market, uh, unfortunately, it's a policy. Uh, it's not only in uh, grapes, not only in agriculture, in, in many other uh, sectors. Uh, it's a policy. They want to, it's part of the uh, economic, uh, let's say, uh, policy. They, they apply to keep the Palestinian economy linked and the next to the Israeli economy. Uh, that's the way they, they think and the way they deal with it. Um, and it's worth to tell you that uh, Palestine or Palestinians capture almost 70% um, in terms of the agriculture market in Palestine. Uh, however, the Palestinians, they capture 30% of its value. So in terms of volume, we are supplying 70% of the demand. In terms of value, we are capturing 30%. And the opposite, the Israelis capture 30% of the volume and capture 70% of the value. So that's it, uh, why it is a policy. Uh, during the, uh, for example, this, the harvesting season of the grapes, they will dump huge quantities in the Palestinian market to um, deteriorate actually the market and decrease the, the grapes, the, the price. So Palestinian farmers, will lose money and that leads many farmers actually to quit farming, uh, not only in grapes and others, uh, it's, it's policy. Uh, and in many cases, the uh, procedures and regulations, they, they impose it. Uh, again, it's um, pushing Palestinians to quit because land in Palestine is, uh, it's actually, it is the battle. Uh, I mean, uh, we are fighting over land. Uh, so they are trying to push farmers as much as they can. Thus, um, um, like tens of uh, inputs in terms of fertilizers, uh, in terms of uh, drip irrigation technologies are banned uh, to be to I mean to to be imported to Palestine, banned from the Israelis. Uh, if a Palestinian farmer wanna export, uh, for example, to Canada, can you imagine that? To take it from Ramallah to Ashdod uh, port, which is like. Uh, like 40 kilometers. It costs more than to ship it from Ashdod to the Canada. Uh, it's simply pushing farmers that agriculture, the land is not worth it, so not invest in that. So it is policy. Uh, it's well known for actors here. So that's why uh, many actors are uh, actually supporting farmers and uh, encouraging people uh, to stay and to do farming and uh, to be able uh, to make some profits from this agriculture, but also to be able to stay in their land. So it is a policy. I'm sorry. Um, again, I think we are reaching our end uh, time. I'm, I'm just asking Wendy that, and she has said we can extend it by 15 minutes uh, and we can take a half an hour break after that. Uh, so if you can quickly uh, reflect on the land issue, it's a large issue. The fact that Palestinian land is not in Palestinian hands in itself is a big issue. And to talk about women's rights on land is a, is a very complicated issue. Um, and it is, so they are doing something about it, but I would not like to spend too much time on it. I have one or two more questions. So quickly respond to that, and then uh, we'll ask maybe two more questions. Go ahead. Okay, uh, well, uh, thank you. Um, almost 65, 60, 65% of the Palestinian land, which is uh, in West Bank mainly, which is the agriculture land, it's captured by the Israelis. Uh, it's a close to the Israeli separation walls, close to the Israeli legal settlements, where even to go and work in your land, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's risky. Uh, I mean, many farmers, unfortunately, they lost their lives simply because they work in their land. Uh, in terms of ownership, uh, it is an issue um, uh, internally. I mean, women access to land, uh, it is an issue. The law is there, the law gives them the right. But the question to what extent that's uh, enforced, uh, that's 
it's a very low percentage, uh, unfortunately, of SLAM and others also working in this in terms of enforcing the law, uh, in terms of uh, raising awareness of people uh, that uh, women, they, they, they should obtain uh, this right by enforcing this, this uh, law to access their land. Uh, but generally speaking, it is a problem. Uh, I will quickly add uh, before I uh, invite Amal. Um, one of the key interventions in this particular intervention that he has shared today is a large amount of C grade or lower grade grape was getting wasted. And so they have brought together a number of women's cooperatives, especially, and men's cooperatives, to convert and get those pro you know, processed into molasses. Molasses is you know, used. Uh, and consumed in Palestine, and a large amount of that was getting imported from outside. So, in, in by introducing that intervention, a they are creating income and employment for women, and uh, in, in, in engaged in that molasses making, and b uh, you know making sure that the prices when there's glut, uh, the prices don't drop too much. So, so there are so there, there are these interventions they are trying not always successfully because introducing so many <laughs> diverse interventions at the same time in a program uh, is not that easy either so i can tell you a bit more about that later uh, but amal come on in amal from egypt uh, what are the policies do, do you take to protect the farmers in securing agricultural production? And are there any partnerships with strong institutions to support agriculture in, ter in terms of disaster? Ashkurak Sayyidi Giddan Shukrak Lewaktak Al Al Reli wa Atamana Laka and Shalkatkum Al Mwakala Al Mazid min at Tawfiq wa Nagahit. Shukran. Shukran Amal. Shukran clear. I should try to, to answer in the Egyptian accent, which is, uh, I love it so much. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much, Emma, for this. Uh, well, in terms of uh, insurance, you touch a very important and uh, sensitive uh, component. Um, agriculture insurance in Palestine does not exist. There are several initiatives um, from other actors, not Oxfam, but all failed. Uh, simply because agriculture insurance um, talk about uh, natural crisis, natural disasters. Uh, and in Palestine, on top of that, we have even um, uh, more significant risk, which is uh, man-made risks. Uh, from the occupation, where they damage and demolish the agriculture several times. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, recently, the Palestinian Authority set up an um, insurance fund um, where it's, um, I mean, the capacity is still it's low, the experience. Uh, it's only due some compensation when there's, uh, again, crisis here and there. Um, but still the dialogue and the discussion whether this should include, um, again, the uh, risk from the incubation or, or not. Uh, we as Oxfam, we are piloting uh, something with the, this insurance uh, fund now. Uh, we need to study it. It's, again, it's a pilot. It's um, a very big uh, uh, field, uh, very risky, um, but it's very needed. Uh, so it is uh, the first time we enter this. Uh, it's in the, we are in the very early stage. I don't have much to tell you about this, 
uh, unfortunately, because they the fund itself would they uh, within the state. I mean, established just last year, uh, so it's not operating. Um, so just an initiative we are developing together with the instruments fund uh, here. Great. Um, now the most important question to you. Um, in Arabic. <laughs> I can ask in Hindi. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, we have been working uh, together uh, as Cody and Oxfam in this, what we are, we have tried to, to name as learning partnership. It has been, a, uh, for me at least, a unique experience because we, either of us didn't know what we are trying to do initially. Uh, we had a vague idea of what this learning partnership would look like. And we have been carrying this on despite many, many, many different challenges um, that we have faced uh, as a program. So if you can reflect on honestly, and I, I can actually walk out of the room if you want to, uh, how has that learning partnership uh, with Cody worked for you or not? And what have been some of the challenges if you want to, to highlight that? Uh, well, you do need to work out. Uh, I'm very honest uh, with you. Um, I think it's a very successful model, uh, very beneficial, to be honest with you, at least from our side. hope it's the same from your side. Um, you know, generally speaking, uh, whatever you do, if you want to evaluate your work, it will be, okay, it's, it's good, at least, uh, if it's not um, uh, excellent. It's always good to have an external eye uh, to come and, and see what, what you have done. Uh, what you plan to do. Uh, might external eye, different opinion, um, a different view that, of course, will en enrich your work. This is exactly what's happening. Uh, uh, in the, your visits, sometimes uh, your colleagues' visits from, from Cody, um, sometimes remote support also, like uh, sharing uh, experience, uh, uh, sharing documents, uh, review and input, inputs, feedbacks, uh, that's helped a lot um, uh, in terms of highlighting the ideas, business ideas, focus, where to focus, where not to focus, um, correction measures. Um, uh, uh, one important point also in terms of documentation, I can tell you, I'm sure um, uh, you also have lots of success to talk about and to tell. But in many cases, uh, like people work in humanitarian and development, they focus more on implementation. In implementation. Uh, they either don't have time to look for documentation for publication, uh, and sometimes, uh, or they don't just give, the, give them their attention. Um, so it's really important to bring external experience, uh, external eye, like what, uh, in this case, it's, it's Code Institute. Um, we we benefited uh, a lot in terms of enriching our interventions, uh, in terms of uh, having different view in the technical parts, um, uh, and the gender analysis, uh, how to capture, how to present. Uh, I can't tell you we have several success stories. We have uh, plenty of success stories, but they are not blended. They are uh, uh, reflected. They are not captured. Uh, as a learning tools, that's that's really very beneficial um, partnership. I guess one main challenge is um, uh, maybe it's work in Palestine, not in other uh, places. Uh, it's access issue uh, because I mean to have you or some of your colleagues sometimes um, um, take take more time than than uh, than should be. I guess because in many cases we need the support like. In this particular time, because agriculture, as all of us know, it's uh, seasonal. So if we miss the season, might be um, a tricky point. So this is, a, I can say, it's the main challenge. But more uh, so far, I guess uh, it's a very successful partnership model. We are so uh, happy with that. Great. Thank you. Um, we'll probably bring that to a close now. And if I may just reflect on our own partnership as well, um, and for the sake of learning as a partnership model. Um, you know, there are lots of consulting organizations who do consulting work for such. We very deliberately chose uh, this learning partnership model, where we said every, the, both the partners have a skin in the game. We both are gaining something out of it. So it is not that the Oxfam is getting the expertise uh, of the facilitation and learning and training and technical assistance and capacity building from Cody. Cody is gaining a lot 
from this experience, bringing them into the classroom. That, that keeps our knowledge and our experience current. It keeps us rooted in the practice. Yeah? And so it's a lot that we get as well as they get. So articulating what the two partners are getting out of it and making that explicit has been very helpful uh, to us. It is not just about the money. Yes, money matters. I would say money has to matter. But beyond that, what is the main purpose? And we had to articulate that for seven years, last seven years. So the donors would ask the Oxfam saying, what is Cody bringing? And it's not easy always to Oxfam to articulate because we don't produce you know, thick reports that the consultants would. But then they are able, Oxfam is able to see the value of this partnership in the long term, of saying how the learning, continuous learning is happening, uh, contributed by Cody. So I can talk more about that, but uh, I'll now leave the last word to you, Mustafa, uh, to, in the closing, and then we'll probably uh, just say bye to you. Go ahead. Well, I'd like to thank you, um, Anuj and uh, Cody. I'd like to thank uh, all the people in the class and in the, the online. I mean, for listening to me on the uh, one and a half uh, hour. Uh, it was very lovely to talk to you. I'd love to... Um, See you actually face to face and to be with you in, in person uh, that also gives us opportunity i mean your reflections and the questions also open our eyes where to focus and also to to benefit from uh, your experience and i wish it was uh, fruitful and worth it it was also beneficial for you thank you very much So folks of uh, you that are online and watching the recording, you'll notice that there is now a link in the chat. That is for our evaluation process. We're tracking, uh, we're tracking feedback from our participants in our webinar series so we can report to our funders whether or not these webinars are, are valuable and useful to all participants. So if you could take uh, about a minute and a half, it's very short, to uh, just to give us some feedback. And I thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.